This short video goes through how interactions, things like contacts and uh, constraints, are managed in finite element analysis. First off, let's talk about what sort of interactions you might encounter in FEA. An interaction in particular is some relationship between degrees of freedom, usually between degrees of freedom that are near each other. Some common interactions that we see are a tie constraint, where you have slave nodes and master nodes and they have to move together, so they have the same degrees of freedom, they are forced to be the same. A coupling constraint is sort of a looser version of that. You've got um, slave nodes on some surface that is related to um, a nearby master node so that you get some general rotation of the surface. A rigid body constraint is sort of like a more rigid, um, a more fixed version of a tie constraint. You have a whole bunch of slave nodes that are linked to a single reference point and there's no internal deformation between the slave nodes. So that gives you a rigid structure and effectively what you've done is remove a lot of degrees of freedom from your system. And then lastly, a contact interaction. So the first three were constraints where we're actually linking degrees of freedom. This interaction, the contact, is where we're saying that we have no intrusion of slave nodes into a master surface, and then we use forces to push the slave nodes away. This is a very nonlinear phenomenon as well. If the nodes aren't close enough, then there's no force, and if they get close, you do get a force. And in the next video, I'll be talking about how we handle that nonlinearity. For the rest of this video, I'm going to focus on constraints. Let's talk about how we describe those constraints mathematically. Specifically, we can write equations that relate degrees of freedom. That's what a constraint is. For a tied constraint in 2D, if we want to tie, say, node 1 to node 52, as shown here, we're going to get two equations. D1x is equal to D52x, and D1y is equal to D52y. For a coupling constraint, it's a bit more complicated. In 2D, suppose you want to couple nodes 4 and 5 to rotation of node 21. So what that means is if node 21 rotates as shown, that's going to force nodes 4 and 5 to move up and down and possibly left and right. Let's look just at the up and down right now. The equation that links these together would be that d4y minus d5y is equal to phi 21, so the slope of node 21, times the distance between nodes 4 and 5. I've labeled that here as L4, 5. So that's an example of a coupled constraint sort of equation. All of these equations, whatever type they are, are in addition to the ones that we already had. So we already had KD equals F, which is a massive system equation. But we haven't added any new variables now, so this gives us an over-constrained system. D are our number of variables, and we've now added more equations. There are basically three approaches that are used in FEA to solve this over-constrained system problem. One is that we use a coordinate transformation to eliminate some of the degrees of freedom and equations to get us a, a, a corresponding number again. A second is that we use Lagrange multipliers to introduce new variables with the new equations. So again, we have a match of number of equations, number of variables. The last one is a penalty method where we don't introduce new variables and we don't reduce the number of equations. Instead, we try to solve the equations in an approximate sense. So that allows the constraints to relax a little bit. I'm going to go through each one of these approaches. First off, let's look at the coordinate transformation. What we want to do is use the constraint equations to eliminate some of the degrees of freedom and their corresponding equations from KD equals F. And then we'll end up with a new reduced set of equations, which is KRDR equals FR. The relationship between the full degree of freedom vector and the reduced degree of freedom vector is a coordinate transformation. And we're going to write that as the full degree of freedom vector is equal to the transformation matrix T times the reduced degree of freedom vector. Just like for beam elements and truss elements where we had transformation matrices, for homogeneous constraint, KR and FR can come from these relationships here. So KR is equal to the transformation matrix T transpose times the original K times the transformation matrix again. And FR is equal to the transformation matrix transpose times F. Again, the transformation matrix um, acts like a rotation matrix. That's why we can use the transpose here. 
Let's go through a quick example with coordinate transformation. Suppose I have this rod made up of three elements and I want to make the center part between nodes two and three rigid. So I don't want that in my system anymore. Specifically, what I want to do is tie degree of freedom two to degree of freedom three. To make the center rigid, we write D2 is equal to D3. And now what we want to do with the coordinate transformation approach is eliminate D3 and its corresponding um, equation. So we have our original degree of freedom vector D1 through D4, and our reduced one is D1, D2, D4. So the transformation equations are D1 doesn't change, D2 doesn't change, D4 doesn't change, and D3 becomes D2. That's the new one. So in matrix form, this is what our transformation equation looks like, and that then defines my transformation matrix. Now that we have a transformation matrix, we want to apply that to our system. So for this system, we have element stiffness matrices as standard for bar elements. That's going to give us a global stiffness matrix as shown. And we have our new reduced matrix that we want to get to, Kr equals T transpose times K times T, where the T's from the prior slide, I've put them in here. Matrix multiplication gives us a three by three new system matrix. And we do the same thing with our force vector. So our reduced force vector is equal to T transpose times F, looks like this. That gives us our new force vector. So our total reduced problem is a three by three matrix multiplied by three degree of freedoms and three forces. So we have reduced the system and now we have a corresponding number of equations and unknowns again. Second method I'll talk about is the Lagrange multipliers approach. The basic idea here is that we're going to increase the number of equations but also then increase the number of variables. So we're going to expand the KD equals F equation the new variables are going to be called the Grange multipliers, and they represent the forces that are required to enforce the constraints. So the process is we're going to add the new constraint equations to KD equals F. That's going to give us a K that has more rows than columns. But then we're going to make K symmetric again by adding columns that are transpose of the constraint equation rows. In other words, we're going to get a symmetric matrix again. Then we're going to add the Lagrange multiplier variables to the degree of freedom vector, and we get a new system equation, which is KL times DL equals FL. So for the same example problem we had previously, where we want to link or tie nodes two and three, this is our original system matrix, and we're adding an additional constraint equation. So the constraint equation you want to write with your degrees of freedom all on the left side and forces on the right side in order to use this. So we're going to add this equation as a new row in our KD equals F. This now becomes an unsymmetric matrix equation. So you see we've added that row down at the bottom. So now we add a transpose of that row as our final column. That makes our matrix symmetric again. And it's now become, instead of a four by four matrix, it's a five by five, and we've introduced a new variable, lambda one. If we were going to work through the solution of this, we could write out that matrix equation as a system equation, um, or a system of linear equations, rather. And then we'd find that we can put all our degrees of freedom on the left-hand side, and the forces on the right-hand side, the lambda ones would go to the right hand side and we can see that those are the two reaction forces required to maintain the constraint. In other words, equal and opposite forces acting on the two nodes. Lastly, let me talk about the penalty method. The idea here is that we're going to impose the constraints as additional penalty elements that have a high stiffness. So we're not going to add number of equations, but we're going to add new elements. The stiffness is WI. The process is we're going to define a spring stiffness matrix for the penalty elements, and we're going to include that, those matrices during the regular assembly step. The new global system equation is the same, but there are now additional stiffness terms in the stiffness matrix. So we're going to put a K caret for a new stiffness matrix 
with those additional terms added. The real challenge with using the penalty method is to balance the choice of these WI terms, the, they're called weights, so that you satisfy the constraints, at least mostly satisfy the constraints, but at the same time you don't have to put weights that are so high that it turns your stiffness matrix into a singular matrix. So it's a Let's use that same example with the penalty method. Here's our original system equation and our additional constraint equation. We're going to define a penalty element that represents the constraint. So pretend we're adding a new spring in between 2 and 3 and it's got a variable stiffness W. Basically we want W to be very high in order to stop the two elements from or the two nodes from moving independently. But if we choose a W that's too big, our stiffness matrix becomes singular. So we're trying to choose a W that is big enough, but not so big as it causes convergence problems. So this is our additional element. We add that element into our global system equation. So we have these new W terms that have showed up. And then we solve the problem. Now, Solving the problem requires having an appropriate value for W. So that's, again, where the challenge really is with the penalty method. A rule of thumb for the penalty method is called the square root rule. We want to find the largest stiffness term in the original K matrix. We'll just call that term K. Then we also want to know the computer's numerical precision, because that's going to tell us when our matrix is going to start to become um, singular. If we are approaching the precision limit um, with too many things approaching zero or too many numbers that are too close to each other. So how many digits are captured in the numerical precision? That's P. So then we choose a weight such that the weight is on the order of 10 to the K power times the square root of 10 to the P power. And if you do that, that should get you a reasonable weight that should satisfy mostly your constraints without making your stiffness matrix singular. In a commercial code, it's going to use an approach like this initially, but then it will monitor. If it has problems converging, then it's going to reduce the rate weight. Um, you often have to check to see if the constraint was not satisfied and then tell the software to increase the weight if it's not satisfied sufficiently.